Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the fourth day of 2024 AIAA SciTech Forum, Outside In. I'm Tom Cooley. I'm the president of TC Space Consulting. After a long career in the government, it's uh, fun to be out in the real world working with a lot of different uh, exciting companies. Today, we especially want to welcome the teachers who are joining us for today's education workshop. AIAA knows teachers are vital members of the aerospace community. We're grateful they are here at SciTech to dive into STEM concepts for the classroom. They represent kindergarten to 12th grade from public, private, charter, homeschool, and out of school time organizations. We're excited they are inspiring students so they can grow up to tackle the aerospace challenges of the future. To begin our morning, we will celebrate our literary award recipients. I would like to invite Kevin Burns, Aerospace Outreach Director, and Jacqueline O'Connor, uh, AIAA Publications Chair, to the stage to help present these awards. It's my pleasure to begin by announcing the 2024 Gardner Laster Aerospace History Literature Award for the best original contributions to the field of uh, aeronautical and astronautical nonfiction literature published in the last five years dealing with the science, technology, or impact of aeronautics or astronautics on society. The award is presented to Margaret A. Whiteycamp. A Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum for her book, Space Craze America's Enduring Fascination with Real and Imagined Space Flight. <clears throat> we are thrilled to welcome Margaret back to the SciTech, uh, back to SciTech after she delivered one of our plenary talks last year. Uh, at the SciTech uh, Sci Forum. Congratulations again, Margaret. <clears throat> Next, we are pleased to present the 2024 AIAA Sommerfeld Book Award to the main uh, editor of the book's best book, uh, recently published by AIAA. The award goes to Jeffrey W. Hamstra, Lockheed Martin for the book, The F-35 F Lightning II, From Concept to Cockpit. Congratulations again, Jeffrey. <clears throat> we are also pleased to announce two other awards whose recipients are unable to join us today. The 2024 AIAA History Manuscript Award is presented to Aaron M. Bateman, George Washington University, for his book, A Space Renaissance, The Strategic Defense Initiative and the Arms Race. And the 2024 AIAA Pendre uh, Aerospace Literature Award is presented to Anne P. Dowling, University of Cambridge, for her book, Combustion Noise. We send them our congratulations on these awards. Congratulations to all the winners. <clears throat> Turning now to the main event for the morning. Our program theme is the future of space operations today. Dr. Erica Rogers is the perfect person to kick off today's discussion. Erica leads the Science and Technology Partnership Forum within NASA's Office of Technology, Policy, and Strategy. In this role, she finds technology solutions to benefit the nation through interagency collaborations, 
She leads coordination, partner discussions, and collection of data uh, analysis to enable the government-wide collaboration. The resulting recommendations are used to advise and advocate concerning uh, agency-wide technology policies. Previously, er uh, Erica was an aerospace engineer at NASA's Langley Research Center, analyzing Mars explo exploration architectures. She developed a software program used to analyze and integrate human and robotic exploration systems, capa uh, capability engineering developments, and space technology maturations, creating visualization roadmaps. Prior to joining NASA, Erica worked in academia, teaching astronomy and astrophysics, and as a research scientist for the Space Science Institute. She's also worked in the aerospace industry for several, several years. Her doctorate is in space physics from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She's authored and co-authored numerous technical and, and uh, journal papers, is a fellow of the National, or sorry, the NASA Graduate Student Research Program, as I am. Thank you, NASA, for paying for graduate school. Uh, and is a recipient of two NASA Group Achievement Awards and the NASA Early Career uh, Achievement Medal. She's also served on the chair, <coughs> as chair and member of the AIAA Space uh, Systems Technical Committee, which is where I met Erica. We are excited to hear Erica's thoughts on future visions of operating in space and the needed technologies and solutions to get there. When Erica concludes her remarks, she will take questions from the audience. Please use the QR code uh, on the screen to ask or upvote a question. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Erica Rogers to the stage. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for being here this morning. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you. The future of space operations, that's our theme today, as Tom just talked to us about. Uh, I'd like to chat with you about how the future of space operations are global, and they're going to be a mix of government and commercial owned with a shift to commercial owned. The global space economy reached 546 billion. Uh, commercial growth there reached 427 billion. For our Artemis Accords, there are 33 signatories, 33 uh, individual, individual countries that are participating within our Artemis Accords. And our Artemis Accords are principles for safe, peaceful, and prosperous future when we go through our Artemis program and explore the moon. There are more than 90 nations active in space, about 50 active and in development spaceports worldwide. And so we are already in this push, global engagement, and that's going to continue in the future of space operations. The International Space Station is an international partnering. There are five space agencies representing 15 nations. The ISS went through a period, different periods over time. There's a construction phase, there was initial research phase into full utilization, and then we have now what we call our decade of results. And we've had crew members on there for over 20 years. On the ISS, in our US segment, it's split 50-50. There's a NASA, 50% uh, of the work that we do on the ISS on the US segment is NASA-based, exploration-based, preparing for our exploration in science. And the other 50% is non-exploration, non-NASA work. And that work occurs in the national lab that we have on the ISS. And the national lab in the ISS has been successfully growing non-NASA interest in utilization of a platform for microgravity research and development. Over 700 projects have flown in the national lab with over two thirds developed by commercial users already on the ISS in the national lab. In 2023, there were 35 publications released um, through the National Lab, bringing that total to 265 since the National Lab first began. So we're already seeing this 
this transition and, the, and this push in the future of space operations, with a lot of uh, commercial engagement and, and this shift um, from the ISS, which currently is uh, a government-owned platform, to at the end of the decade in 2030, we'll be having commercial LEO destination commercial platforms that will no longer be owned by the government. And so NASA and its partners are working right now to figure out this strategy for how we shift from a government-owned platform to commercial-owned platform, and how do we continue the work that we do at NASA, how does the community continue to do the work, and how to be really inclusive in all of the needs of the community. Our CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services, this is where commercial providers deliver science and technology to the surface of the moon. 14 vendors, eight planned missions, you can see them there on the map, to the near side, far side, and the south pole of the moon. On Monday, Astrobotic launched their lander on a ULA Vulcan rocket. Uh, there are 20 payloads, uh, 20 payloads uh, on this lander. Only five are NASA payloads. 15, the other 15, are from organizations around the world. Right, so only five NASA payloads. The science uh, that we, we had planned to do there were to measure possible water molecules on the subsurface and on the surface, measure the radiation to improve our understanding of how solar radiation interacts with the surface so that we can prepare for our human missions. Next month, um, there will be another CLIPS launch. In February, Intuitive Machines will launch the Nova Sea Lander. That'll be on a Falcon 9. Also going to carry five NASA payloads, and there will be four commercial payloads. Right? So there's the, the split. There's some work for science and exploration, and then there's all the other work that the global community wants to do going to the moon. The science that we'll be doing on um, the lander that goes next month, looking at plume surface interactions, radio astronomy, and space weather interactions with the lunar surface. We're also gonna be doing some tech demos that are planned on this next mission. We'll be setting our precision landing technologies and then our communications and navigation node capabilities. In these global, uh, future space of operations and where we're having to shift to commercial uh, ownership, the how is going to be really important. How we do is important as what we do and why we do. At NASA, we explore, we discover, we expand the knowledge for the benefit of humanity, and in space, we do that through human exploration, technology development, and science. But we really got to think about how we're doing what we do. For our Artemis program, like I mentioned, we have 33 signatories in the Artemis Accords. Again, these, these principles for our, our peaceful, peaceful and prosperous uh, uh, plans that we have in our Artemis program. And some of the, the core things that are embedded in there are being transparent about the policies and plans that everybody has, de-conflicting activities, and avoiding harmful interference. Releasing science data publicly also to ensure that the entire world can benefit. And the how that we're doing this work is through global dialogue. For our technology development, last month we demonstrated NASA's first two-way end-to-end laser relay system. There's a terminal on the ISS and then a laser communications relay in geosynchronous orbit. They ex successfully exchanged data for the first time. Laser comms are going to increase our efficiency of data transfer, and uh, this is very beneficial to our transfer rates for all of our missions that we have uh, planned. The laser communications relay that we have is conducting 300 experiment configurations with the ground stations that we have here on Earth. Some of these experiments are submitted by NASA, others are submitted by uh, partners in industry, academia, other government agencies. And the how here of developing technologies is partnering, right? not doing it alone. That how is very important. How do we work with the community to develop the technologies that we all have an interest in? For science, all right, the sun there, I've got this great picture of the sun. The sun influences the earth and the solar system. We study solar flares, the solar winds, space weather, and this allows us to protect our technology on earth, um, the technology in orbit, it helps protect our astronauts, and then it helps us also explore the moon and beyond. Right now, we're in what we're calling our heliophysics big year. There was an annular eclipse in October, April 8th coming up, there's a total solar eclipse, 
that's going to cross North America, and the Parker Solar Probe is going to have its closest approach to the sun in December. Also, this year, we're predicted to reach solar maximum. The sun is very dynamic. We're, we're predicted to reach uh, solar maximum. There'll be increased solar activity, more aurora that we'll be able to see here on the Earth. So this heliophysics big year is inviting everybody to be excited to learn more about the sun and to get out there and share in science and art uh, related to the sun. So you can go check that out on our NASA pages if you're interested. But the how here is that we are engaging with the public. We are bringing people with us. We are exciting people. We're sharing our knowledge. So this how idea is really important uh, as, as we have our future of space operations going forward. I want to tell you a, a couple of things about my organization, the Office of Technology Policy and Strategy. Uh, it's, we've, uh, our office has been here for two years. It's a fairly new office. Uh, we have 30 members on our team, and we work together to help position the agency for success. We're future-oriented. Right? We're, we're thinking about what the future space operations are going to be. What are our next missions going to look like? And we do a lot of thinking about the how. How do we want to do this in the right way? It's an analytic organization. We do assessments, and we look at drivers inside the agency, outside the agency, that can inform our decision making. And the way that we do that is that we engage with a lot of people. We engage all over the agency, across the interagency with all of our government partners. Uh, we work with and learn from academia. We work with and learn from um, all of our partners in industry because we need input. We need to get all those different perspectives from everybody so that we can do good assessments, so that we can help inform our decision making. And all that feedback we get really helps us think about the how and, and share the how and incorporate that within our decision making that we have at the agency. We work for our office of administrator, our mission directorates, and uh, all across the agency. We always try to be very transparent in the work that we do, and we share as much as we can. So I've got a, a, a bit coming up here, and I want to show with you a couple of the studies that we have released publicly, to include one that we're releasing just this morning. If you're going to add value and impact, you have to have a multidisciplinary team. And so I just want to you know, give a big shout out and a big push here. We're talking about multidisciplinary and bringing in different points of view. So like I mentioned, we work all over the space community to get input, but we reflect that as well in our own team. Uh, we have policy analysts, uh, economists, technologists, engineers, scientists, lawyers. Uh, we bring all of those folks together to be able to do good assessments. Uh, my background, as Tom mentioned, is science and engineering, and I learn from our policy analysts and our lawyers all the time. Uh, and I provide input from my background and point of view. And so this idea that if you're going to add value and impact and really think about the how, you need to consider all the different points of view that can be there. All right, so some of the work that we do um, in OTPS. Moon to Mars is a really big push. It's a focus area for our agency, and it's a focus area for the work that we do. We're studying emerging technologies to help establish and est help establish the norms of behavior. Our Moon to Mars objectives, you may have seen these. Um, it, it's, a, it's a nice informational, you can go find them on our NASA website. And there are 63 objectives, and these are in categories of science, transportation and habitation, infrastructure and operations. And these 63 objectives are what we're going to do. What are we trying to achieve? These are all the what's. We also describe um, in our Moon to Mars objectives why. Why are we doing this work? Why are we exploring the moon and Mars? Science, inspiration, and national posture. And it's, it's very clear and it's described. Please go check that out. The how, the how we do this is also very important as what we're doing and why we're doing. There are nine recurring tenets in our, our, our moon to Mars objectives. And those are really focused on the how. 
And some of the language that we have in there is related to collaboration. How are we going to explore the moon and Mars? Collaboratively. We are going to have responsible use when we explore. We're going to have interoperability of our, of our systems that we're all developing. That's all laid out at a very basic level, but then now comes all of the work to figure out how do you do that really effectively. So that's some of the basis of the studies that we do in order to create value and impact to the community. Just yesterday, we released uh, what we're calling our policy questions framework. Within those 63 objectives, we took a look at them, and then we constructed this framework, and we identified 12 policy questions that come up when you're trying to achieve the Moon to Mars objectives. And what we found after having a lot of dialogue with folks is that you really need to start thinking about these policy questions early on in the conceptual phase. When you're planning a mission or planning a project, there's the concept phase, there's formulation, you develop and implement, and then you operate. And if you wait to the operations phase, or wait to the operations phase, it may be too late to be able to implement some sort of policy tool that you should have been considering early on. And so what we found is that generally earlier in the concept phase is the best place to be asking yourself these questions. We're going to be asking ourselves these questions at NASA, and then we're encouraging the community to take a look at this framework as well. And although we leverage the Moon to Mars objectives, really a lot of these questions can be posed uh, you know, for, for any mission there. It doesn't have to be specifically to the Moon to Mars objectives. We're partnering globally, and we're engaging with the public in the work that we do. So these questions uh, that we have, like how are you going to develop sustainably? What is the role of NASA and the role of partners? How do you protect valuable locations? How do you have interoperability and standards? Because of all of our partnering, this isn't just solvable by NASA. Right? The, it's, you, we can lead and engage in dialogue, but a lot of this is on the entire space community to be working together to do this so that we can figure out how to do the work that we need to do together. So the, these policy questions uh, framework are there. There's a QR code. It'll take you to our website. You can take a look at the informational sheet that we have. And how we're using this internal at NASA is to inform our decision making to help our, our missions and our programs. There's a QR code again, and just showing you a second QR code for another study that we put out this year, uh, talking about lunar landing sites and considering the technical and the policy considerations when we're selecting landing sites on the surface of the moon. Half of the upcoming missions planned to the surface are targeting the South Pole region. This could lead to constraints, high density, right, in an area in the South Polar uh, region. It could have many operations within a small area. Also in the, the South Polar region, uh, the light, if you follow the light um, over the course of the, of the rotation, then and navigable terrain, you can find very narrow passageways and transit corridors. So if there's a, a situation where we have several missions on the, the lunar surface in the polar region, these transit corridors, uh, you have to be very considerate and understanding that there might be multiple people there. So this could be, lead to challenges if you've got a lot of close proximity of operations. So you can take a look at this other, this other um, report that we have here for the QR code. What we say in the report is that when you're implementing policy tools, you need to be transparent, you need to coordinate, and then you need to put these tools into practice uh, after you engage with the community. Space sustainability uh, is more work that we do in OTPS uh, to inform the agency and uh, discuss with the community. We're studying the long-term availability to utilize space for science, exploration, and commercial activities. We released a study this year, again, there's a QR code, where we did a cost-benefit analysis of orbital debris remediation. And we cite that remediation is the moving, removing, or reusing the debris that's in Earth orbit. We created a model uh, for economic risks to operators that are imposed on satellite operators to shield spacecraft from debris or to move, maneuver around debris. 
we looked at two scenarios uh, in our modeling. We looked at large debris remediation, estimating the benefits of removing the 50 statistically most concerning objects in LEO. We also looked at small debris remediation, where we estimated the benefits of removing 100,000 pieces of small debris, one to 10 centimeter debris. And this would be in the 450 to 850 kilometer range. The small debris is non-trackable, but it's the most numerous. And the findings from this report uh, show that removing small debris and nudging larger debris to avoid collisions is the most effective remediation method um, that we could use based on a cost-benefit analysis. And we show that the results could be beneficial with under or within a decade. So please go take a look um, at the report as well if you're interested. It's important because it provides information to NASA to help us think about our future missions. And it also provides information to the interagency and to industry to better understand our remediation challenges that we have uh, with debris in Earth orbit. So this how we might solve debris, radiation, debris remediation is right there. How could we do this effectively? Right? So it's thinking thoughtfully about how we can solve a challenge together. How do we inform our future policy? Technology disruption. Uh, this is another key area that we have in OTPS. We look at trends ac across NASA, globally, and we really want to help the agency understand the technology now, how to jumpstart new, and then how to champion infusion into the next missions. So that's why we're uh, very, very pleased today to uh, release just this morning the results of our space-based solar power study uh, that we've been conducting um, over the past year. We calculated the cost to generate electricity from a space-based solar power system. We also calculated the emissions from a space-based solar power system. These are first order calculations that we did. And we were motivated to do this work for a couple of reasons. We were motivated because global space space solar power uh, uh, research is picking up globally. It's been accelerating over the past five years. There are studies, design concepts, technology developments that are all being funded around the world by academic, commercial, and government communities. And, and they're doing this for economic development, net zero goals, and for national goals. And we wanted to better understand why there was this, this acceleration. Uh, also, we were motivated by net zero. The US electric power sector is, uh, produces 25% of the US greenhouse gas emissions. Most of those are CO2 from coal and natural gas. We wanted to understand if space-based solar power is a source of electricity generation that could contribute to net zero goals. And those were our motivators. So what we did is that we designed two systems, two space-based solar power systems. They were broadly derived from historical data, publicly available designs, and they include recent updates. Because we wanted to be able to have enough information to perform an assessment, a first order assessment of this kind. These systems, you see them here um, up on the chart. They collect solar um, energy in geostationary orbit. They convert to microwave radiation. They transmit that energy to the Earth. It's received on the Earth. It's converted to power, and then it's delivered to the power grid. The design on the left, that one there is a heliostat swarm concept, where you have individual heliostat that focus and concentrate the light. The one on the right, the mature array, planar array concept is a, a solid planar array and has microwave emitters on the back. Both of these systems are normalized to two gigawatts. These systems are very large. <laughs> they're, they're large, they're massive. The solar panel areas really dominate the size. And the solar panel areas are 3,000 times the solar panel areas that are on the ISS. These systems are 14 times more massive than the ISS. 
and we went through this entire assessment. Uh, it's a life cycle assessment. And we put together, they would take many years to be able to go through this full life cycle. Take 10 years to develop all these systems on the ground. So what we have in our report is that these systems are developed on the ground throughout the 2030s. So a decade of development. And then to launch and assemble these, uh, these systems also another decade. So we have for the 2040s is where we would be launching all of these systems to LEO, and then we would transfer them and assemble them in a geostationary orbit. That would all take the 2040s. All to begin operations in 2050. So we set this up so that operations begin in 2050. We say then that they, they operate for 30 years from 2050 to 2080 while they're transmitting energy to the Earth. But while they are operating, you have to continually maintain these systems. So while you're performing maintenance during all these operation years, you're still developing, launching, and assembling new spacecraft modules. And then at the end of this life cycle, you have to dispose. You have to figure out how to dispose of these very large systems in GEO. So then you have to develop and launch debris removal spacecraft to GEO, and then transfer the spacecraft systems to perhaps a graveyard orbit, as we have cited in the report. What we found through this life cycle is that we calculated the life cycle cost to generate electricity and the life cycle emissions intensity to generate this electricity. And we found that the space-based solar power designs are expensive. Uh, they are 12 to 80 times more expensive than if you were going to have a renewable energy on the ground. We compared to wind, solar, fission, all on the ground, and we found that these systems are 12 to 80 times more expensive than a renewable uh, energy terrestrially. What we did find is that the, these uh, emissions, the emissions that we calculated, they may be similar to the emissions that are produced by renewable energies on the ground. And I say may because this is a first-order first assessment, and you really have to have a, a, a really good understanding and detailed analysis of how our atmosphere would respond to so many launches that we cite in the report that you would need to launch all of this mass to LEO and then transfer it up to GEO. Uh, we're talking thousands of launches uh, that we have uh, for this. So more work to do. This is a first-order assessment but uh, you would really have to do some more detailed analysis to really know for sure. The launch and the manufacturing are what really drive the cost and the emissions for these systems. So what we did in the report is we looked at all the levers, like what, what's driving the, the launch and the manufacturing, and then we started playing with those levers to start to think about, like, what could you do to start to reduce this cost? Right? And then that informs development in the future. So the, number, uh, the two top things were if you have a lower launch cost. If launch costs were really reduced uh, to around 50 million per launch, uh, that would be very beneficial to really help out your costs. Also, what we baseline in the report is using Starship to go to LEO, refuel the Starships, and then take those to GEO. So the second round through, we took a look at if, you, if we did perhaps electric propulsion to go from LEO to GEO, if we did that orbital transfer differently, then that could also reduce uh, the launch and the manufacturing costs as well. We took a look at a couple of other things, that if you extend hardware lifetimes, if you can have uh, longer lifetimes for your hardware, that would also be beneficial for your cost. And launching those uh, servicer um, servicer um, spacecraft to assemble, <laughs> uh, your assembly uh, portion that you have to do, as well as the debris removal vehicles, if those were cheaper, if those could be manufactured cheaper, that would also be beneficial. Efficient manufacturing at scale, we found, is also going to be something that really has to be uh, thought about, like how efficient can you be in your manufacturing when you're manufacturing over and over and over again for something that's such a big undertaking in so many systems that you would be launching and manufacturing. So you can take a look at that report. The QR code is there. You can dive into it. And like I mentioned, the motivators for doing this, because we want to understand what the community is doing in their tech development, and we want to help inform decisions at NASA. So we don't have space-based solar power at NASA as a use case. 
uh, we're, we're not pursuing. It's not a driver for NASA technology development, but we want to understand where the community is and where they're thinking and how they're developing and why they're developing technologies. The, the, the underpinnings um, for our space-based solar power systems for technology, they require ISAM. They require servicing, assembly, and manufacturing, but at a very large scale to be able to do these big systems. And so we have that in the report. We also are assuming very generously that there's significant autonomy of distributed systems operating in geo. Right, so, we, so we make some really big assumptions to, for this report, and you can go take a look and, uh, and read about them. Also, we're assuming power beaming um, from geo all the way to the ground. And so these are areas of technology that the community is working on. Uh, they're enabling for space-based solar power. And we're working on these technologies at NASA as well, but just not for space-based solar power reasons. Right? We have our own NASA reasons uh, to be pursuing. They have broad applicability to our, to our future mission needs, power beaming on the moon, autonomous operations for our science and human exploration. But we want to know where the community is because we want to know who we can partner with. Even if you're not developing technologies for the same reasons or the same application, you can still partner effectively with the community where, when you know where that work is. So please uh, uh, follow the QR code and then you can go check out this report. We're also encouraging the community to do deeper dives uh, uh, on, this, on this work as well. So wrapping up here, uh, I just wanted to share that um, for our future space operations, global, and this mix of uh, commercial-owned and government-owned, and this requires engagement from all of the space community. So I have a call to action here for all of our students. Um, you are important, very important piece of this. Learn your discipline, learn it well, and along the way, find ways to contribute to strategy development and policy development. And then over time, you need to be leading that strategy development and policy development. Thank you. Outstanding. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Erica. I've already been getting a few good questions, but please uh, uh, go and look. Maybe some zingers for you. Um, <laughs> Please uh, look, upvote, add questions to it, and I'll be tracking that as we go through this. Uh, I'd like to begin with a few questions of my own to get started. Um, we, we, you talked some about the, the uh, essentially how you're working with commercial. This is fantastic, in my humble opinion. Um, how do you see NASA over the next decade or more uh, really helping that, I'll call it a, the new space economy, uh, develop areas like space-based solar power or, or other uh, uh, areas that, that you see are economically going to help both NASA, the, ex the scientific exploration mission, but also, um, I'll say, the, the, the broader economy as, uh, again, space-based solar power is a very yeah. good example. Yeah, well, space-based solar power, um, you know, if that were to be, um, you know, that's not, necess like, not necessarily the case I showed, you know, it's very expensive, but if it were to be, it's a big undertaking that would involve many different sectors. Um, manufacturing, uh, launch, operations, um, development of technologies. And so something that large would involve commercial uh, tremendously. B because you would want to consider if you were to do such an undertaking, how could you do it effectively? How could you reduce the cost as much as you could? And how do you engage and partner with the community effectively? So, um, you know, any organization would do that in such a way, I would hope, <laughs> uh, like, you know, like we do at NASA, where you find um, how to uh, help stimulate the, the economy in areas that we would like to purchase something from later so that we could be one of, of many who are purchasing those services. Excellent. Um, you also talked about debris removal. This has yeah. been something that a lot of folks, I'm gonna say, have admired the problem. Yeah. Uh, we've studied the problem. Uh, uh, there's there been a couple of um, uh, initial programs, both in Europe and in Japan, uh, looking at the technology, advancing those technologies. Mm -hmm. How do you see um, the future of debris removal, uh, particularly for NASA and the United States? 
What we've done over the past couple of years um, here in the US, we have a national um, orbital debris R&D plan that was put out it, uh, through OSTP. Uh, the interagency community uh, all uh, provided input to that, and it's an interagency piece of work led by OSTP. There is also what came after that, the National Orbital Debris um, Implementation Plan. And so if you go and take a look at that, there are many different government entities that are listed in there as having a lead role or a support role in the work to do in this national, this national implementation plan. There's NASA, DOD, state, commerce, FAA, FCC, all these different agencies have a role to play, uh, and you can go check that in there. And there are uh, three different uh, categories inside the implementation plan. There's a mitigation category, a tracking and characterization category, and there's also a remediation category. And so NASA is lead in one of those categories, in a couple, but in um, one specifically, remediation, and taking a look at and exploring what could be potential technologies for remediation. And so that's the study that I shared is a little bit um, related to that about the first step and thinking uh, uh, more critically about those technologies. So just as a follow-up, do, do we see new programs being initiated in the near future for going after remediation, de really developing those technologies, you know, going from demonstration into how are we going to do this as a routine uh, uh, cleanup? Yeah, in that, in that national implementation plan, you know, there is language in there for exploring those technologies. So the idea would be after time, you know, how could they be implemented and how could they be used? Yeah, excellent. In space, uh, servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. Yeah. Again, we've seen the White House uh, come out with a policy yeah. on that in the last uh, year or two. Uh, very exciting to see that type of uh, advancement in space, getting logistics in space. Um, how do you see a NASA really adopting that uh, as, as part of their, their, their normal operations? Again, the theme today, space operations. How, how, is, how is NASA going to change? And really, what are the opportunities for uh, other uh, companies, young engineers? How, how, do we, how does this evolve? So back to the, um, the national policy that you mentioned. So there are two um, OSTP documents related to ISAM. And for the first one is the strategy, the national strategy, again, an interagency body of work uh, led by OSTP. And the second document that came out was the implementation plan that followed from that strategy. And again, there are many different agencies that are, that are listed in there with lead roles and, and support roles. And there is specific language in there for NASA um, to start a consortium. And we've done this uh, over the past year, the COSMIC uh, Consortium, and it's meant to get the, um, the commercial um, teams, the commercial providers, together to engage with the entire community, with NASA, with academia, and to have dialogue within this consortium to figure out how do you tackle these, these challenges. And so COSMIC was stood up this last year. Um, the kickoff occurred very recently in November. So you can go to the, the COSMIC website and then you can learn more. NASA STMD is the lead on this, but then we have an FFRDC that manages. And so, um, and you can go read all about the structure there, but it's really about engaging commercial and engaging everybody, um, you, know, um, you know, very broadly. Uh, at NASA also, we have our OSAM-1 mission uh, that we're working on. We will have a component of uh, servicing. We will service the spacecraft. We are also manufacturing a, a beam, and then we are uh, assembling an antenna um, on our OSAM-1 mission. Excellent. I'm going to turn to some of the, the, the good questions that are coming in. First is, is one really on how NASA operates. Uh, decadal surveys uh, have been used for, for many decades uh, to determine the missions and requirements of those missions for NASA. Does the rapid innovation in uh, tech and commercialization make this timeline too conservative? 10 years. Yeah, decadal 10, yeah. Uh, yeah, the decadal surveys are a significant 
um, role for the science community to contribute what the needs, the collective needs, and the prioritization of the science community. And then we at NASA take that in very seriously, and then we plan our mission set, our science mission sets toward that. Um, the CLIPS program uh, that I mentioned earlier is led uh, you know, out of our science mission directorate for one of those ways that we could have commercial vendors sending landers to the surface uh, with the hope that we could have quicker turnarounds so that we could get science faster on all of these payloads to be going to the moon in, in a more rapid cadence. And so um, that is, that's our, our first take at being able to do that and think about how can we reduce some of those timelines to get science faster uh, to where we need, which, which could include uh, um, some tech development as well that occurs on those landers. I, I think the, the spirit of the question, and, and I've participated in some of those decadal surveys, but that once a decade, National Academy bring a lot of lot of lot of brains together to, to talk about these things. You know, is it? I'll I'm, I'll maybe challenge you. Should we do like a a, a, um, a you know version two of the decadal survey every five years? Or I mean, is that is that that kind of a thing? Again, in order to try and say, we've discovered some things in the last five years. How does that change the dec decadal survey? Is that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a broad question for our it is. for, it's our, a, it's for a, our science community to weigh in on, yeah. um, as you know, as they uh, they own that process. Um, I, I think it's a a constant dialogue that we have in science and out of science. How do we refresh our technologies faster? I mean, that's not just exclusive to the science community. We are. It is a constant dialogue, which again, this commercial shift that we have in the industry is really a reflection of, of trying to do things faster. Um, every five years, I don't know, uh, for, for a, I, a, a half I just a made half that decade. up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's something to chat with. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, uh, in terms of the, again, some of the commercial questions, as space becomes more commercial, how will NASA's exploration and science goals be balanced against industry's goal, uh, goal of profits? Yeah. Also, uh, constant dialogue that, that we have. Um, those, the CLIPS missions um, on the astrobotic lander, like I mentioned, only five. Only five were NASA. Um, the other payloads uh, are, are whatever they're going to need to be. Um, you know, and that's nothing, we don't have any say in that, NASA. So um, we, we have a service uh, for a lander and, and uh, we have our payloads that are there. The commercial LEO destinations as well, these will be commercial platforms where we will want to do uh, NASA work, exploration work, our interagency partners have work that they want to do as well. So the government has work that they want to do. Um, in a microgravity environment for, for research and, and technology developments. Uh, when we're on a commercial LEO destination doing this work next door, I don't know what's going to go on in the, in the lab next door, right? I mean, this is something to be discussed um, as we go forward and set our strategies. And a lot of this dialogue comes up to how do we have an effective strategy and how do we set policies, right? You know, a lot of this is a conversation amongst many different agencies as well, and it's not just the NASA conversation because th there are many equities in space at different agencies right, in the government. Right, 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 excellent, thank you. Um, how is NASA looking to leverage other countries' space programs, such as India's South Pole moon landing, to speed up our habitation, uh, sorry, uh, habitation of the moon and Mars? We are always excited. <laughs> When, uh, when, when, uh, when somebody goes and, and performs, uh, you know, successful work. Uh, we, uh, we, we are learning everything that we can, and it's back to the, the global dialogue that we have. Uh, through our Artemis Accords, we engage regularly with the international community on the ISS. We engage uh, with our international community all of the time, and it is always about um, what do we want to do and how are we going to do it, and how are we going to make sure that we are respectful of each other's work, how do we de-conflict our activities, uh, how do we be responsible, and so um, it is always, it, it's always a discussion to make sure that everybody gets their needs met. Right, right, right. 
So um, just a couple of days ago, I believe, we, we heard that the uh, uh, Artemis program, <laughs> you knew this was coming, uh, the, the, there's a slip in the launch, the, the launch schedule. Um, could competition models speed up the timeline for future space operations compared to the current partnership model? Is there, a, is there a talk, again, as we see that slip to maybe revisiting that where uh, NASA has done a lot of commercial competition? Is that, is that on the table? That I don't know. Uh, yeah, Above yeah. my pay grade, yeah. right? <laughs> that, that, I, that, I, that I don't know. Um, I, I, I um, guess, so we, we announced 25 and 26. Um, for Artemis II and Artemis III um, for, for our, our planned missions, which I'm very excited about, uh, by the way. I think we all are, which is why I'm sure it, it came up a, yeah. as a question. But, uh, you know, some of that is being driven by the, the development life cycles uh, you know, yeah. for the systems. Yeah, space is hard. Yeah. Um, how does the increasing democratization of space affect NASA's technology policy and strategy planning? Does it free free you to be more risky, exploratory, or does it, uh, you know, how does that change the, the, the demands for, mm. for NASA? That's this, I, I don't want to say explosion, but we do see a lot more activity in space. Yeah, yeah, when you're democratizing. So, you know, there's the, the thought that if it's not the only thing that you have, if you don't have something exquisite, that maybe you could be perhaps a little bit more, a little more risky. Uh, exactly. Right, you know, if there are, if it's one of many, uh, or if you know that the cadence is going to be higher because you know you're going to get another launch or another shot six months from now or a year from now, instead of it being the the only thing that you get. Uh, so, um, back to the CLIPS program, um, you know, high risk, right? Like the CLIPS program is more, is much more of a high risk program, uh, right? Commercial entities sending landers to the surface, uh, and one I think we have planned for orbit, high risk. Um, and so, you know, you put your, your payloads on there, and, and hopefully that turnaround time is quicker, that cadence, but then you accept some of that risk. How can a young engineer, we've got a lot of students here, yeah. we've got teachers here, how can a young engineer or student prepare for the future of space operations, space exploration, um, we were young once too. How would you, what would be the, the words of wisdom you would impart to this uh, crowd of young people who are aspiring to define what that next uh, phase of NASA is 15, 20, 30 years out? The one thing I mentioned at the very end was kind of a broadening statement of as you're coming, when you're a student and you're focusing, you're, you're very down and in on that particular area that you're learning. And then you transi transition to, like, how do I take this expertise that I have of knowledge and translate it into expertise of building a thing or developing a thing? And then you start to get really good at that, at that area, whatever that is in your discipline. And so my offering is that expanding, expanding yourself, expanding your knowledge, and working with as many people as you can that are outside of your area, and being on multidisciplinary teams is really effective. And in STEM, we do this a lot. Uh, you know, it starts often in your, your upper undergraduate, in your project classes, moving into your graduate programs. You get a lot of that multidisciplinary team, but sometimes you still have to look and get out of like the engineering and science disciplines as well, right? Like go to the other building um, on campus or, you know, or go in your office, go to down to, you know, two floors over or whatever the case may be to find the other teams that are doing something that is even outside of that circle of multidisciplinary. Because the, you know, the more that we engage and the more that we build and develop and we do the, these, grand, these grand ideas and, um, and, and explore for science and exploration, then you have to have all of those different inputs, right? Because then it affects the strategy as well, right? Back to that, how are you gonna do things? You need all of that input there. So I, I encourage everybody to, to branch out as much as you can. I think that's great advice. I would, I would, I would share that as a piece of counsel for, for young folks. Um, uh, I will uh, uh, ask a question, one of the questions here, because I spent most of my career working with the military space, working with the Air Force Research Laboratory. Um, the question is, uh, with the creation of the U.S. Space Force, 
do you believe NASA's focus may shift uh, this as to a more military applications in the future. How has that dynamic changed, if at all, uh, in terms of NASA's interplay with the other agencies that are involved in space? Yeah, that's good. Um, NASA's mission not shifting, we are civil space. Um, space Force is, is not civil space, um, um, it's military space. So two very distinct um, mission sets and applications and two very distinct whys. But, um, still part of the broad space community. Uh, I work very closely with, with the Space Force, as do many folks in civil space, because um, the space community is the space community. We are all engineers and scientists, and we come from the same schools, and, and, and we know each other. And so what's also important is the technology, the underlying technologies and capabilities that you need to go to space are the same. Right? You do different things with them, you have different mission applications, but you can have tremendous relationships with the Space Force and across the entire government um, in technology development and planning strategies that affect multiple agencies, all that have equities in space. And so interagency dialogue is very fruitful, interagency collaborations can be very fruitful even when you don't have the same application. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, maybe one of my questions, but it's really a, almost a personal question, which is, in your opinion, what is the most exciting program coming down the pike uh, from NASA? Which, which one will have the biggest impact? What, what, what do you see as the, the, again, the most exciting thing that we should be watching? Artemis II and Artemis III. Back to those. Oh, um, that's an easy answer. Come a, on, oh, you can, you can give us you can one. give us a little more detail. Okay. There's a lot of programs with within that, and Th and there are. Um, but I think the excite. Okay, I'll I'll add more. But just like the the first the first excitement of humans orbiting the moon, and humans landing back on the moon. I think is very exciting, right? Uh, we, we've done it before, okay. I was not alive when it occurred before, but like, it, you know, it's still exciting uh, to see a representation of a human being elsewhere. And uh, the first woman and the first person of color are going to be doing this. So for me, it still generates excitement. Um, also what excites me is um, in LEO, the work that we do on ISS and transitioning that to commercial LEO destinations. There's tremendous work uh, that goes on in a microgravity environment, tremendous R&D. And what also really excites me is that the market developing um, for more work, uh, for more free flyers or our commercial platforms or CLDs um, that we're transitioning to, I think that's also really an exciting area to be watching because I want to see how that plays out because that is something that could lend itself more towards democratizing right in Leo um, before that we do that before we do that democratizing more into a cis lunar cis lunar environment. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you for sharing your message with us today, Erica. Uh, in appreciation uh, for your participation, I'd like to present this uh, AIAA uh, coin challenge coin to you. I think so. There you go. Um, uh, thank you to the audience today uh, for, for coming out for this conversation. Uh, I just want to remind you at 10 a.m. we're going to hear about visions ahead, upcoming missions and beyond uh, from an expert panel. At 1 p.m. don't miss the idea challenge, the Artemis Generation Speaks, uh, where you'll have an opportunity to hear what important, what's important to young professionals in our community. And 2.30, Join us at the KSP Differential Game Challenge, where our finalist teams have designed software to maneuver satellites uh, engaged in non-cooperative space operations. Tonight, you can end your day with the popular Women at SciTech panel discussion and social hour. Lastly, don't forget that today is your final chance to visit the Expo Hall uh, and the Hub. Uh, let's thank Erica again for her sharing her thoughts with us. and enjoy your SciTech day.